Thank you, Valentini. Um, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to the seminar. I hope we walk through together on what we are facing uh, currently as well as for the past few years. So as it says, uh, we are going to talk about disaster resilience and are we ready before the next one strikes? Before I uh, go into the details, I would uh, heart felt uh, I would like to give my heartfelt thanks to my mentors, uh, Professor Ralph Pike. He was my uh, advisor in graduate school, Dr. Subhash Sikdar, uh, who was my mentor at EPA, Professor Mahmoud al Hawagi, and Professor uh, Stratus Pistikopoulos, who are continuously supporting me in all the activities that I do here at Texas A&M. So I would uh, like to start by thanking my mentors. Uh, I would like to thank my sponsors over the years. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to present today is a culmination of all my years of research. So uh, I would definitely like to thank ORI, so, who sponsored my postdoctoral research as EPA, uh, the National Science Foundation, who has uh, sponsored several research projects at Texas A&M University, uh, where I have worked, uh, the Qatar National Research Fund as well as the U.S. Department of Energy under which uh, we are having several projects in which I'm working currently. <clears throat> I would finally like to thank my academic and social networks, um, my undergraduate university, uh, Jadavpur University, uh, Louisiana State University for my graduate school, the U.S. EPA, uh, Texas A&M University, and also my social networks in Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, ResearchGate, as well as my uh, uh, network with uh, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. So we are witnessing history um, as we know and we are living through it. So the observations from uh, March 2020 as of June 30th, 2020, we are going through coronavirus outbreak and uh, the total cases around the world on June 30th was about 10 uh, million people uh, with total deaths of more than 500,000 people. Um, so if uh, we see the entire spectrum of uh, what a small virus did and the output is the number of deaths over this short period of time. Uh, we are also going through different other disruptions due to the coronavirus outbreak or as an additional uh, disruption. So we have had during this time, we have had energy disruptions, we have had uh, food security issues, we have had our research labs closed, uh, we have problems with migrant laborers, uh, school closures, flooding, earthquake, um, and uh, cyclones. So uh, what and this is not what we are seeing just in the United States. This is what the world has shown us. So just to give you a brief uh, idea of what uh, the research community has been uh, doing, the National Science Foundation has made over 750 COVID-19 grants for rapid response research, which means that as we speak, there are people who are working on the research on COVID-19 and they are uh, creating uh, value to the society. So first I would like to start by defining disasters and what disasters are. So what we have seen in the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak as we saw in the previous uh, opening slide is that the COVID-19 has had a global impact. So this uh, is from the CDC and it shows that the countries that have reported any cases of COVID-19, it's all around the world. Very few places, the ones shown in yellow, have not shown uh, any global impact, any, any impact from COVID-19. We go back a few years, uh, about in 2017, Hurricane Harvey uh, hit Texas and there was a regional impact in Texas. Um, we had record rainfall and flooding and, uh, of course, the damage from the winds uh, that happened. Now, these two are disasters. Now, when I started looking for the definition of disaster, one of the uh, most uh, acceptable disaster definitions 
was according to FEMA, and I'll just read through it. A disaster is defined as an occurrence of a natural catastrophe, technological accident, or human-caused event that has resulted in severe property damage, deaths, and or multiple injuries. So, and then they go on to say that a large-scale disaster is one that exceeds the response capability of the local jurisdiction and requires state and potentially federal involvement. As used in the Stafford Act, a major disaster is any natural catastrophe or regardless of cause, any fire, flood, or explosion in part of the United States, which in the determination of the president causes damage of sufficient severity and magnitude to warrant major disaster assistance under the act to supplement the efforts and available resources or states, local governments and disaster relief organizations in alleviating the damage, loss, hardship or sufferings caused thereby. So this definition from FEMA is quite inclusive and we can naturally see that the coronavirus outbreak has been <clears throat> a disaster of massive proportions. We have heard it from different entities, uh, from the government, from companies, from industry, and uh, everywhere around the world. As well as we are also, we have some knowledge of previous disasters in terms of hurricanes and flooding and uh, other. So my talk today is going to revolve around <clears throat> disasters in general, but. I may be uh, referring to the hurricanes uh, as catastrophic incidents, as well as the uh, coronavirus as a catastrophic incident in, in disaster. So um, there is an obvious uh, impact of disasters and the cost of disasters. So for the cost of disaster uh, related to the coronavirus, the total cost is unknown yet. And uh, what we know of sure is that the coronavirus has caused a massive recession. And uh, this is from Wikipedia, uh, where it is uh, being compared to the Great Depression or it's far worse than the Great Recession of 2009. So now at this point of time, we only know things qualitatively. We are yet to fathom uh, the full cost of this disaster. In the past, uh, the Na uh, NOAA has the National uh, Center for Environmental Information at NOAA has uh, quite accurately or within some confidence intervals uh, put a cost on US uh, billion dollar disaster events. And this is a chart that we see from uh, 1980 to 2020 where uh, we have uh, massive disasters and the peaks that you see in the uh, lines right around uh, here and here are the two massive disasters uh, that happened in uh, 2005, which was Katrina, and in 2017, which was Harvey. Uh, just for an example, uh, the Katrina was about $160 billion and Harvey was $125 billion in its cost. Uh, in 2019, there were 14 separate billion dollar weather and climate disasters, and which had a total cost of about $45 billion. So it's just that by chance, we are escaping some major uh, events, uh, major costs in uh, certain years, but when things get out of proportion, things can go very uh, costly and it can be uh, more than um, $100 billion in a single event. So that uh, brings us to the question of disaster management. So uh, when I was looking at disaster management graphs and uh, how uh, disaster is managed, uh, I came across the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, which is one of the world's uh, leading organizations for uh, disaster management. And they uh, typically work m for the two uh, very important things, the response and the recovery parts. So this is uh, their graph on disaster management where you have a phase where you're preparing for disasters, you have a phase where you're reducing or risks of disasters, and then the disaster happens. Immediately you have to respond to disasters and then following that you have a recovery phase and the reducing of risks 
from disasters. So it's a cyclic phase. So you see that we have this uh, first step and we have uh, this disaster and its response. And then we have the uh, step uh, repeated again and again. Now, how does, uh, how, how do we respond to disasters in terms of uh, businesses or entities that are uh, facing this disaster? So there are continuity planning guidelines uh, from FEMA. So this is a continuity planning guideline that uh, I found on pandemics and widespread infectious diseases from July, 2018. And typically what they consider there is program management plans and procedures of essential functions, the order of succession and delegation of authority, communications and information systems, uh, essential records management, alternate locations, human resources, devolution and reconstitution. So you have a kind of a planning guideline from the federal agencies. Now, I looked at what businesses do, what do they do with this planning guideline? And there are uh, business continuity planning guidelines that they create either through their own uh, set of uh, uh, personnel or through consulting uh, businesses, which uh, help you in business continuity planning. But when I looked at the research space for business continuity planning methodology, there was, um, limited. I wouldn't say that there was nothing, but there was very limited and it mainly uh, was in the realm of business and uh, the, in, the, in the space of business uh, school space and not very much in the technology space. So um, the common obstacles that one of the uh, companies which consults for oil and gas businesses uh, said in this in their uh, website is that there is uh, uh, for common obstacles for business continuity planning is that there is a lack of management support there are budget restraints there is um, a lack of maintaining a culture of preparedness there is lack of business continuity awareness and training and uh, there is a lack of identifying critical processes and also unidentified threats and vulnerabilities. So all of these are obstacles that um, come in the path of business continuity planning. So we have these planning documents, but what went wrong? So we had this coronavirus outbreak, and we have also seen in the past with the hurricanes and natural disasters. So what goes wrong? What is it that actually went wrong that we are having such a huge loss in life. Plants can fail. And what next? So that brings us to the question of, uh, question on research on disaster resilience. So um, personally, I've been looking at the research space, uh, not only uh, as a chemical engineer, which I am, but in terms of a researcher, where do we stand on disaster resilience? So this was uh, in the Journal of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And this article came out in 2010. I'm sure we have made some progress towards the research on disaster resilience since then. But they did a study on disaster resilience indicators for benchmarking baseline conditions. But interestingly, quite interestingly, they note in this paper that the policy community is slightly ahead of the research community in pushing resilience as a means of mitigating disaster impacts. Lingering, from concerns, uh, lingering concerns from the research community focus on disagreements as to the definition of resilience, whether the resilience is an outcome or a process, what type of resilience is being addressed, whether we are looking at economic systems, infrastructure systems, ecological systems or community systems, and which policy realm does this belong to or should it target? Should it target counterterrorism, climate change, emergency management, long-term disaster recovery, or environmental restoration? So that is a very valid question that we have to address as uh, researchers on disaster resilience. So then I uh, also went uh, through the National Academy's report on disaster resilience. I think this came out in 2012. And here also we look at their uh, table of contents, 
where uh, we see the same uh, pairs of understanding, managing and reducing disaster risks, making the case for resilience investments, measuring progress, how do we build local capacity, the landscape of resilience policy, and putting the pieces together to build a more resilient nation. Again, when you see at this report, there is a lot of policy and a lot of work that is being done for the communities, which is understandable because they are the first ones impacted. But this also leaves us with a research question that are we doing enough from the research community? So um, now I'm going to go into some translational ideas and novel concepts from process systems engineering perspectives. The reason I uh, bring in process systems engineering perspective is because most of the disaster resilience research that we see now are structured around uh, the civil and bu the built infrastructure. It's more on infrastructure resilience, which is uh, directly uh, applicable to the communities that we serve. Um, but there has been very little research on the manufacturing infrastructure. And that's where I think uh, the process systems engineering perspectives can play a very crucial role. So what is process systems engineering? For those of you who are not uh, conversant about process systems engineering, it has been around in various forms for over 50 years, uh, mostly under the labels of process design and process control. In 1982, the first international symposium on process systems engineering was organized in Kyoto, Japan, that the term process systems engineering was adopted as the general term to be applied to the different areas, such as process design, control and operations, and this also included product design. Dr. Grossman uh, very um, uh, aptly has put in uh, this uh, very nice review paper, uh, and he has said that the first one, there, there were two uh, major works, pioneering works in process systems engineering as a, as a discipline. And the first one is the article, Integrated Design and Optimization of Processes, published by Professor Roger Sargent. And this article was a true visionary in it that it outlined the areas of process design and integration with control and reliability. And it addressed developments of process models, which is steady state or dynamics, and the strategies of process calculation and computational methods for optimization. Furthermore, the article also uh, advocated for collaborations with researchers in control systems, operations research, numerical analysis, and computer science. The second major pioneering work was a textbook, uh, Strategy of Process Engineering, and this had uh, three major parts defined for process systems engineering, where we had creation and assessment of alternatives, we had a definite optimization, and we had engineering in the presence of uncertainty. So this, uh, in a nutshell, is the history of process systems engineering where we started from over 50 years ago. Now, uh, in the broader scheme of uh, things, 50 years is probably nothing, but at least uh, we, had a, uh, we have a vibrant group of researchers who work toward looking at the basics of processes. And by processes, this can be anything that you see around you, anything that you're touching now has been a product from the process systems engineering community because we have to have design and we have to have uh, integration for anything that we produce. Now, the second concept that I wanted to uh, put forward, and this is from the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition, uh, the difference between sustainability and resilience. So often thought to be synonymous, the term sustainability and resilience, in fact, refer to two different concepts. They are not diametrically opposed because both of them target sustainable development. So there are two components of sustainable development according to their definition. And that is that comes from sustainability and resilience, which together work towards sustainable development. So while the concept of sustainable development targets development, which can at least in part avoid changes and their negative consequences on people and the environment, 
Resilience is more about tackling and overcoming these changes without being completely overwhelmed by them. Despite what some others may think, shifting from policies focusing efforts on sustainability to others which promote resilience does not mean admitting that defeat of sustainable development. Instead, it simply marks a shift in focus, integrating various approaches to obtain a better outcome. So in the concept, sustainability and resilience should be integrated into a single uh, form for us to go forward with sustainable development. Um, now I would uh, briefly introduce you to the concept of systems and sustainability. And this uh, was published in our book, Measuring Progress Towards Sustainability, where uh, we looked at the three pillars of uh, sustainability from the aspect of economy, society, and environment. So there are the three pillars and the economy is the heart of the economic capital. The society is the heart of the human capital and the environment is the heart of the natural capital. And we have to have a good balance between the three of these to have sustainable development or sustainability. So that is the concept of sustainability that we start with. Now under the economic capital, some waste is recovered and recycled or it can go into the environment. Some uh, of the human capital is used for uh, environmental development and uh, some of the environment, and we derive most of our uh, raw materials for both the economy and the society from the environmental capital. So there has to be a balance and a right balance in the three of these pillars for us to go forward in uh, development. Now, uh, since we talked about capital, there has uh, been theories in economics where um, there are five types of capitals that have been proposed and the five capital model provides a basis for understanding sustainability in the term of economic concept of wealth creation or capital. And any organization will use all these five types of capitals to deliver its products or services. So there is a manufactured capital, there is a financial capital, there is social capital, human capital, and natural capital. So um, if uh, you want, I can go into the details of these descriptions, but right now let's just focus on the fact that there are five types of capitals. And there are five types of sustainable capital from where we derive the goods and services we need to improve the quality of our lives. And the observation is that the concept of an organization needs to include all operating institutions in a society so schools, colleges, universities, and other public or private entities need to be engaged in this model for true sustainable development. Now, uh, the other thing in sustainability that we have uh, worked with, and this is adapted from uh, a seminal work by, on sustainable development and sustainability metrics, where we define the scale of systems for sustainability considerations. So there is a global system type one, then we have a more uh, system bounded by geographical boundaries such as national systems and regional systems. Then we have business systems and from the businesses we have sustainable technologies. So these are the four different scales of sustainability. Now, if you see um, the disasters that we have seen, in the beginning I showed you a global scale disaster which was the coronavirus outbreak as well as the local or like more regional uh, disaster, which was the hurricane. And we can uh, look at the business or institutional scales or even the technology scales, and we can fit some disasters like process safety incidents as disasters, which can be uh, fit into these other different scales. Now the typical realm of PSE or process systems engineering lies at the intersection of the uh, sustainable technologies and a bit into the sustainable processes and somewhat into their related supply chains. So this is uh, the typical realm of PSE. That doesn't mean that we do not work across the other scales, but this is where our focus has been over the past 50 years. Now, there is a need to infuse systems thinking in engineering design, and this is uh, where um, we 
bring in the concept of systems thinking in engineering design curriculum. This was a chapter in uh, one of the encyclopedias of sustainable technologies, where we looked at what is the path forward for sustainability education. And there we looked at systems thinking as an engineering approach that studies com complex technical, social, and related problems through their basic elements and study the interrelations uh, and evaluate these interactions through the aid of mathematics and synthesizes various elements into a complete integrated system. You can go over the rest uh, of this, but basically what this uh, says is that we have to think of systems when we look at engineering design. And that is the focus of uh, going forward in, in terms of uh, how we can deal with different uh, disasters. Now, there is a gap that exists between the sustainable scales or uh, the systems that uh, scale for sustainability and what we have process engineering. Uh, we have typically known as process systems engineering, where uh, we do multi-scale modeling from going from molecules up to unit operations and then going to the uh, uh, scale of uh, the supply chains. So this uh, was one of the works that I had done with Procter and Gamble in uh, while working with EPA, where we had developed a process of understanding or bridging the gap between process engineering and life cycle assessment through multi-scale modeling. And how we uh, do that is uh, like it is possible. But uh, the main uh, point here is that we need to bridge the gap between the uh, system scales of sustainability and the industrial processes that exist as of today. Now, what does resilient systems engineering uh, say? Here, um, I have uh, shown a, a small uh, excerpt from designing resilient system of systems, because when we go beyond process systems, uh, we see that we are in a world of different other systems. We have our electrical grid systems, we have our um, food, energy, and water systems, and we are taking uh, parts from that system to build our process systems community or process systems uh, 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 industries. And there we see that uh, we have to design resilient system of systems, and there, this is a 2015 paper where they have looked at the systems requirements uh, as some things that are constant and some things that are variable. And there are constants that they have defined as resilience, reliability, robustness, and safety. And the variabilities uh, come from flexibility, pilability, agility, as well as safety. So there are two components of safety. But what do they define resilience as? So they define resilience as a performance uh, disruption where a nominal level of performance is uh, disrupted due to any event. And then uh, there is a phase where there is surviving the disruption, and then there is a recovering from the disruption phase. And this part where we go back to the nominal performance, where we have this resilience concept put in. Now, there can be variabilities in the possible resilience curves. So recovery measures can include a temporary increase in performance and or disruptions can result in long-term impacts on performance so that we do not par perform at the nominal performance levels. Now, there are other uh, variations of this concept where we completely fail and there is no recovery possible from such events. And we can go into the details of that. But this gives you a snapshot of what resilient systems engineering means. Now, then we bring back the discussion on disaster management, where we have typically four different cycles, uh, four different parts in disaster uh, management, which is well, parts are after event and before event, where we have response, recovery, mitigation and preparation. And then we go into the cycle of disaster. As I mentioned, the cycle of uh, disaster uh, exists um, from the Red Cross uh, document that we showed, uh, there is a cycle that's associated with disasters and we have this uh, response recovery mitigation and preparation cycle. Now, uh, similarly, the FEMA has uh, made uh, significant research efforts and they have put together the cycle of preparedness. 
So how do you become prepared? And so you have identified all possibilities, disaster scenarios in your area, make a list using the uh, list, take actions, build an emergency kit, have a family plan, uh, practice the family plan, evaluate results. So this is just one of their cycles of preparedness. But most of this is again, uh, when we look into the details of this, this does not have significant scientific inputs from the processes or the systems or resilience theories that has been applied to such uh, documents. So here comes the question, should disaster resilience be a combination of sustainable and resilient interceptions. And by interceptions, we mean that how can we stop the disaster from happening, which we probably cannot in certain cases, but what if, and what are the interceptions at these different levels, response, recovery, mitigation, and preparation, and what should be targeting resilience and what should be tar targeting sustainability so that we can have sustainable development. Remember the Barilla uh, definition of sustainable development. So the translation concept that we, are, uh, we can bring into this is for disaster management cycle, we can consider sustainability as a steady state and resilience as the ability to bring a process system perturbed by shock, in a which is in a dynamic state, back to a steady state. So this is something that we can bring from the process systems engineering community for disaster management cycle. The research question that remains is how do we switch? When do we know that a system is sustainable? And when do we know that a system is resilient? Or what do we do to make this switch so that we can have seamless transitions? So I'll uh, target about two case studies for this and um, I hope uh, we can uh, go through this pretty fast so that we can have uh, the questions. So the first part, I wear my hat of the Associate Director of the Texas A&M Engineering Experiment Station's gas and fuels research sector. This is very important for us to understand what is the future of the oil and gas sector and how can we have disaster resilient manufacturing? So one of the key questions that we have uh, had to um, that that has uh, been uh, like bothering us is how did oil prices in the United States end up in the negative, which you can see in April, there were uh, uh, a, a very uh, like significant event that oil prices went negative for the first time in history. And there were reasons for that. We can go into the details of that on the different uh, systems that were uh, under shock and what happened, but how did the oil prices in the United States end up in the negative when our masks, PPEs, ventilators, sanitizers use the products from the oil and gas business? So that is very important for us. And that's why I would like to spend a little bit of time on this slide where we have the energy feedstock, which is our upstream, uh, which uh, can be your oil, your natural gas, um, you have a robust chemicals manufacturing uh, sector where we have propylene and other chemicals which are produced, ethylene, propylene, and others. And this is, uh, this is also still very robust, but these are the chemicals or these are the materials that go into our healthcare products manufacturing sector, which we have seen is very vulnerable, which we have uh, seen the vulnerabilities in that process, where we uh, the vulnerabilities can uh, come from geographical boundaries, uh, sudden demand increase, supply scarcity from geographical restrictions. But the key sectoral uh, deficiencies were seen. So when I looked at the NAICS code 38, which caters to the healthcare products manufacturing sector, there was very few existing US uh, companies, which were at that time, this was back in March, where these were being produced by US companies. So there is definitely a gap that exists between chemicals, um, the uh, raw materials that are produced in the United States and the products that are produced in the United States. And these are the products that go uh, from the manufacturing sector into the final products 
And then we can look at the use and disposal of those, but we have the N95 masks, we have the surgical masks, we have the PPEs, the gloves, the uh, ventilators, these hand sanitizers, all of these use the products from the chemicals manufacturing sector, which are existing and existent in the United States. So what happened? The question that is there, so this, uh, gra this uh, is a very famous Sankey diagram from the Lawrence Livermore National Lab where we see the energy consumption in the United States and we see that we have a mix of both renewables and non-renewables in the United States. But the products that were manufact are manufactured comes from the industrial sector. Our, uh, PP, our uh, chemicals manufacturing also comes from the industrial sector. However, the reduction in the transportation had caused uh, a reduction in the production of the transportation fuels. And since our uh, chemicals and petrochemicals industries are tied to our uh, transportation fuels production, which is the petroleum refinery sector, we have seen that there has been some sort of discrepancy and we are not able to understand what that is, but there has been a uh, problem with the industrial sector because of the transportation sector. So that's uh, what we have observed. So the question is, okay, we have the raw materials or we have the intermediate products present in the United States. How do we switch? Can we switch? Do we have any ways in which we can switch? And that is a research question. Now, um, there is uh, an important component uh, where switching between sustainable and resilient systems is uh, important, where we, the time is the essence in planning. So here we see uh, Harvey's uh, history and we see the dates in which the Harvey progressed, August 13th to uh, August 26th is when uh, it stalled over Texas. Uh, it did the first landfall in Texas on August 25th, uh, and then it did a second landfall as well. But we see that there is about a 15 day lead time for hurricanes. Now the question comes, how do we manage all the systems that are intricately ring linked? How do we prioritize? What are the inputs and outputs required? And how can we make the transition robust? So within this um, time frame, we have to make all these decisions and we cannot do this uh, immediately. We have to have the planning. Now for the five to 15 days lead time for COVID-19 that we have seen, again, the same questions come. How do we prioritize? What are the inventories? How do we plan for sudden surges in demand? But these are all research questions that process design or process engineering community has the ability to, uh, to address. So here I'm going to go over very quickly uh, through some uh, seminal works. Uh, and this is uh, from the 90s and earlier times where uh, Professor Pistacopoulos has uh, worked on novel approaches for optimal process design under uncertainty. They have also worked on flexibility analysis of dynamic systems. Uh, Professor Mahmoud's uh, recent, uh, it's, it's not recent, but the recent uh, edition of the second edition of the book, Sustainable Design through Process Integration, deals through uh, some of these uh, concepts, the basic fundamental concepts of process systems engineering. Um, I myself have uh, worked on my PhD for chemicals from biomass, where we integrate bioprocesses into existing production complexes for sustainable development. Um, sustainable supply chains for consumer products. This is the work that we had done with Procter & Gamble working on bounty paper towel operations. And just uh, to let you know that uh, Procter & Gamble also produces uh, toilet paper rolls, which are some of the, uh, one of the scare, uh, scarcity of the products that we have seen in, in this uh, pandemic. So some observations that shocks can propagate and impact supply chains. There is a relation between global shocks and local shocks. There is a critical need to evaluate supply chain nodes and links uh, to reduce this vulnerability. Existing insights from robust systems can be used for translational research on supply chains. And there is a need to optimize the resources, intermediates and product costs, and smaller mobile units for conversion of raw materials to final products may help. 
towards this direction, we just published a um, concept uh, note from Advanced Manufacturing Progress, where we have uh, outlined this exact uh, problem and we have uh, made process systems engineering uh, inputs as one of the key necessities for which we can go for modular process intensification and which can promote resilient manufacturing. This has been published in CEP in June 2020. Um, we have also come out with a special edition in Frontiers and Sustainability. And if you know someone who wants to, who is thinking in this direction, we would definitely uh, request you to give a paper um, in this uh, research topic. Uh, if you want, I can discuss this with you further. Um, but uh, we would like to get uh, some uh, of the research uh, thoughts that are out there in resilience, reliability, and flexibility via chemical process design. And we are looking at any sort of disasters, starting from uh, weather hazards, geopolitical unrests, or the COVID-19 that has affected, where we are looking at repurposing our process plants. The second um, uh, project that I'm going to discuss with you is uh, disaster resilient food energy and water systems. And this is wearing my food energy and water uh, coordinator hat with the Texas A&M Energy Institute, where uh, we look at humanitarian crisis and sustainable development. So I'll shift focus to India, uh, mainly because India has also been hit with uh, the pandemic and uh, India had a unique problem of uh, migrant laborers and migrant workers who go from their hometowns in a certain state to work in a different state. And there are estimated 139 million migrants in the country. And the International Labor Organization predicted that due to the pandemic and the lockdown, about 400 million workers would be poverty stricken. They were given four hours notice to say that they don't have a job and they were put out on the streets during this uh, COVID-19 lockdown. So that has been a humanitarian crisis just there. And now uh, shifting the focus to the state of West Bengal, there has been um, a massive category five super cyclone Amphan. This is from the CNN. And this has been the strongest storm ever recorded in the Bay of Bengal. The city of Kolkata was in its direct path and it has hit the Sundarbans region of West Bengal right around this area, which is the River Delta region. And there are millions of people who have been homeless and they have been put out of uh, food, energy and water. So the impacts, we are yet to fathom the full scale. We may never do that. What we know is that there has been a societal impact about uh, four, 43 million people have been impacted. There has been an economic impact and there has been an environmental and ecological impact. Now, if we look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and this is uh, coming from the psychological concepts, there are some basic needs, there are some phys uh, psychological needs, and there are some self-fulfillment needs. And Maslow says that it is quite true that a man lives by bread alone when there is no bread, but what happens to man's desires when there is plenty of bread and when his belly is chronically filled? Now we see that this, these incidents, these massive disaster incidents have put millions of people below the level of psychological needs. So that is the basic, uh, physiological needs, sorry, the basic needs have been uh, taken out of their equation. So that leads us to a very important concept of food, energy, and water. So if you look at the basic needs, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, some of these are the basic needs that people have. And energy makes these things possible, but food and water are also two of the major basic needs that people have to deal with. And that's where we have seen that there is a problem that we have faced. Now, how the, then the question comes is, how do we deal with the food, energy, and water security issues during disasters? And again, we ask the question, how do we switch? What are innovative interception methods to ensure the continuity of human life? So uh, with that, I would like to 
conclude on the key points for disaster resilience as we need to revisit fundamental concepts to make processes inherently resilient. We have to look at innovative process and systems designs. We have to go for novel groundbreaking engineering interceptions, process systems engineering concepts and models, overall systems thinking and analysis, convergent approach towards implementation of PSE solutions. And I again ask the question, are we ready before the next one strikes? And my answer is that no, we have to have critical, there is a critical need to create value for disaster resilient manufacturing and food energy water nexus systems through engineering, science and process systems engineering based solutions. Um, I'll give, I'll just walk through the brief uh, history of the energy, uh, Texas a and Energy Institute and why we are uh, very uh, eager to work on these uh, topics. Uh, we have more than 290 faculty affiliates through different colleges, about uh, 20 Texas A&M University departments, nine colleges and schools. And uh, we have uh, branch campuses in uh, different countries. Uh, we have four interconnected theme areas, but again, these theme areas are not written in stone, as you see that we have diversified into the uh, into different areas of food, energy, and water nexus, into convergence research, into circular economy. But all of them come from the core concepts of these uh, areas, and we uh, uh, strive to work on these uh, theme thematic areas. Uh, we have uh, research, uh, existing research that's going on. I'm personally involved in two of the Rapid Institute uh, research uh, proposals. One is the diamond, and the other one that's not mentioned here is an education uh, proposal, which is called uh, Complete. Um, we have uh, the Data Sciences Center for the Texas A&M Superfund research. We have the Water Energy Food Nexus. Uh, we have some NSF uh, funding that's active under the Water uh, Energy Food Nexus initiative. I personally also have a project with Texas A&M Qatar University, uh, Texas A&M at Qatar, and uh, on a, a joint research project proposal there. Um, we strive to work with the TS Gas and Fuels Research Center. We uh, closely coordinate with the Texas A&M Energy Institute to bring uh, cutting edge research in uh, gas and fuels processing, especially gas processing and fuels characterizations. And we also have uh, worked on the National Science Foundation uh, ERC planning grant, uh, which is ready. And uh, we uh, have a network formed between six universities around the Texas Gulf Coast uh, and numerous uh, state agencies and other entities for which uh, we have been thinking in this direction for uh, about some time now. Um, and we have an engagement model where we partner with uh, different entities and we work towards uh, making better solutions for uh, the future. Um, I would like to take a brief moment and show you the Texas a and Energy Institute's core incubator. This is where we have recently started, launched the core convergence research incubator. And uh, as you see that the uh, topics, the projects that I just mentioned that we are looking at under disaster resilience would very well fit into the convergence research where we have to have inputs from different uh, entities uh, to solve the research problems that we are, are facing currently. With that, I would like to thank you and uh, I would leave you with a uh, note uh, from Professor Laurie Peak. She is the professor in the Department of Sociology and uh, where she looks at children uh, and their psychological vulnerability. So I myself have a five-year-old and uh, I think the disasters affect uh, children the most uh, and uh, whatever we do today is going to impact their lives in the future. So with that, I would like to answer any questions. <laughs>